Fire Department. What's the location of the emergency? Uh, it's on 24th Street, Aspen. Okay, in the McDonald's there, ma'am? It's inside McDonald's. Uh, okay. one, of it, one of our employees fell down. Okay. And she's pregnant. Okay. Is she complaining of any pain anywhere? I'm sorry? Is she complaining of any pain? Yeah, she's crazy. She can't stand up. Okay, I'm going to get some help on the way out there. Okay. Where is she having pain? And she's, having, she's pregnant. Okay, how far along is she? I don't know. Do you like know how many months? months? Four months. Four months? Okay. Did she hit her head or pass out at all? I'm sorry? Did she hit her head or pass out at no, all? No, she fell down like in her bottom. And she wasn't up on a ladder or anything? She just no, fell she from just, standing? No, she just slipped from on the floor. Okay. All right, just keep her comfortable. Don't move her. They'll be there in just a few minutes okay. to help her out, okay? Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, May 31st at about 2100 hours, uh, Engine 61 was dispatched to a fall injury at 3323 North 24th Street in McDonald's. Uh, we get in the truck. PTI is a 24-year-old pregnant female, tripped and fell. That's the only information we got. Roll up on scene, and we were met by the manager immediately outside. Uh, she confirmed that there was uh, somebody who tripped and fell. When we went in, we actually were led back to the kitchen, which was still in full operation. Uh, Patrons were making their orders, burgers were getting cooked, fries were getting fried. Go back to the back of the kitchen and there was a female at the top of the stairs laying down. The only information we continued to get from the manager was that she tripped and fell. Try to figure out what's going on, okay? We're gonna put a blood pressure cuff on you. Do you know her name? Anything? She was, she wasn't really talking to us at all. She, she seemed like she was either injured or upset, crying. Uh, slightly hysterical with the way she was, wasn't, wasn't uh, answering any of our questions. Nobody there was really uh, helping us with uh, any information. It's like nobody knew what was going on. If you need to try to control your breathing. You're breathing too fast. You're going to hyperventilate. You're gonna st your fingers are going to start to tingle. You're going to have cramping. So we, can you try to work with me here? Are you, is your stomach hurt? At some point, one hurt? of the other workers told us that she <laughs> fell as she was coming up the stairs. So myself and uh, the engineer decided we'd go down and see if there was something okay. slippery or, or what I'm might have happened. We're going to just check it out. Does anybody know her name? smell anything? I don't smell anything. Does anybody know her name? You're going to hide anybody know what happened? We got to the bottom of the stairs, and he was ahead of me. And, uh, and we were just, you know, using our nose, trying to sniff it around, see if she slipped on something, if it was wet down there. We didn't know. Didn't really smell anything. I didn't really smell anything. But, uh, you know, my engineer said that he could smell something. As I was taking some deep breaths, I knew that, or, or I, I felt like a little burning in my throat and, and a little burning in my lungs. But you know, when we looked around, we were, we were really in the basement for maybe 15 seconds. But there were paint cans down there. There were chemicals down there supplies uh, that they would normally keep in, in a basement or in a shed. I said, something doesn't seem right. You know, I said, Let, let's get out of here. I don't, I don't, something's going on. I don't feel right. I smell something really weird, you know, and he, and he agreed. We decided to go ahead and head back up the stairs. Um, and about, I was about halfway up when I looked up and saw uh, my engineer fall into the wall. <laughs> As we're walking back up the stairs, um, right as I got to the top, I started getting lightheaded and dizzy. And right when I got to the top of the stairs, I, I, I just like collapsed and like fell, and and it, you know, just kind of uncontrollable. I, I couldn't and couldn't control myself. I just uh, um, wasn't sure what was going on. And I didn't really understand what was going on. He didn't seem like he was that disoriented while we were going up. But just as about the same distance. Uh, that I was from him. As I cleared that distance, I got really lightheaded myself. The breaths that I was taking started to cause me to cough. And uh, as soon as I got to the top of the stairs, I told my captain, I don't know what's down there, but something is down there that's not making me feel right. It's not making me, you know, breathe right. What's going on? <coughs> uh, there's something down there. <coughs> Let's go. Everybody out. Everybody out. Let's go. Grab her. Let's get out of here. Out of here. Everybody out of here. When I looked at him, I knew something was wrong. And they said that they almost passed out. Uh, and uh, I knew they weren't joking around. So immediately uh, called for a three and one hazardous, uh, an additional ALS and a rescue for the patient. Uh, luckily, there was a Phoenix police officer on scene who kind of saw us rolling hot 
and it was nice having a uniformed officer there to help us evacuate the restaurant. Uh, there were still people in the drive through making their order, uh, people sitting down and eating. We got the restaurant uh, evacuated immediately. Uh, the response was on its way and uh, we were able to, uh, my guys were still functional enough where we were able to stretch, uh, hand jack a line across 24th Street, stretch a hand line, and uh, wait for our hazmat teams to, to roll up. Phoenix McDonald's had to be evacuated after fumes caused a pregnant employee to pass out. This happened last night near 24th Street and Osborne. Police got the call that a pregnant employee had fainted in the stairway. Workers say she had been feeling lightheaded and dizzy, and authorities found carbon dioxide leaking from the soda machines in the basement. They say it was a dangerous situation, and it was lucky that no one was hurt. The woman is going to be okay, by the way. You know, restaurants historically, and Circle K's and everything else, have historically used CO2 to carbonate their beverages, but they've always been just pressurized tanks. Uh, in the last, and I don't know when it's happened, but we're seeing it more and more often where they're starting to use liquid CO2 doers and uh, because they can fill that one CO2 tank, the owner told me once a month, where the other tanks, they were filling them every couple days. Really what had happened down there is with that liquid CO2 uh, leaking, it filled that, complete, that basement completely up. It was basically a swimming pool full of CO2. So you have a, a huge CO2 liquid tank below grade and, and a, a fairly significant leak at a 3,000 to 1 expansion ratio. It, it pushed a, a significant amount of oxygen out of the air and filled the whole, whole basement up with CO2. We assembled an entry team in full PPE with breathing air. Uh, we also brought down our, um, what we call our serious meter, which is an uh, air, air monitoring meter, and also our uh, gas ranger, natural gas meters. Uh, upon going down the stairs into the basement of the McDonald's, uh, I immediately got uh, an alarm on my Sirius meter indicating there was a decreased amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, which was concerning to us because, you know, obviously there's something in there that's displacing that oxygen. That means something's going on down there. Uh, so we proceeded down the stairs. Uh, at the base of the stairs, uh, almost immediately, all the alarms started going off on all of the meters, uh, including the natural gas meter, which was a little bit uh, concerning to us because we really weren't expecting that. Uh, we brought that down just to be safe, but uh, that meter was indicating almost 100% uh, gas in the atmosphere, uh, which kind of changed the, the, the perspective of the whole incident because it really wasn't something we were expecting. Uh, so at that point, we sort of decided that, you know, this was more than we had bargained for. This was definitely something that was extremely hazardous, uh, and we elected at that point to uh, withdraw out of the space, uh, go back outside, um, secure the utilities to the building, and then kind of talk about what we had found in a, in a safe location so that we can come up with maybe a better game plan to handle this. One of the things that I did notice when we were making our entry uh, when these meters were going off is I, I did view this CO2 tank and I noticed that there was a device next to it that was that marked that it was a CO2, dete or CO2 detector and it indicated that it had power to it, it had a ready light uh, and it was also not alarming at the time. So that was one of the things that was kind of a curveball to us in this incident is that we had every reason in the world to believe this was a CO2 leak, yet it had a detector right next to the container itself that was not indicating that there was a problem at the time. Uh, later, I believe it was discovered that tape had been put over that uh, detection device while they were filling it or working on it for whatever reason, and they neglected to remove the tape, render rendering the uh, detector useless. Normally, things that are that hazardous or have those types of, of chemicals involved are always very clearly labeled as to emergency procedures to shut down, uh, et cetera. This really didn't have any of that. There was no clear markings as to how to shut the, the container down. So we were kind of starting from scratch in terms of the learning curve of how to secure this. Uh, we were able to locate some very small thumb valves uh, on several of the different ports at the top of the container, which we you know, assumed could only be valves that would shut the product off. Uh, there really wasn't a main valve, a big thing, anything painted red or something that you would discern as in emergency situations that you would secure that with. Um, so we turned off all the valves. Um, we didn't hear any active leaking at the time. Um, it showed that the uh, container, I believe, was half full, which if it was filled that day, that led, led us to believe that there was possibly something involved with that where half that product may have escaped out. So we did secure all of that. We also checked the hot water heater and some of the other um, gas appliances down there and they were they appeared to be functioning normally 
Um, at that time, when we were down in the basement, uh, we were getting oxygen readings of 17.5% uh, uh, on our serious meter, and normal would be 20.8, 21%, something in that area. So several percent of the ambient oxygen was being eaten up by something that was uh, down in that basement. So we definitely had something pretty serious going on. Uh, we did secure the uh, CO2. We uh, also had the gas secured, so at that time, uh, it was made, uh, the decision was made that we were going to go ahead and back out and we were going to attempt to ventilate the space and see if that, was gonna, if that would change the atmosphere. Um, since we had the squad truck with us, we already carry confined space fans with us, which was a valuable tool in doing this because with a confined space fan, you can put the bellows down into a subterranean space and vent it from the bottom. And since CO2 is heavier than air, it sinks to the bottom and that's where all of it's going to be. And this fan device will actually suck air from the bottom and expel it out of the, out of the building. So it was actually a very effective tool uh, that we used to get this space cleared. So we did set up a confined space fan. Um, this particular model had the basement with an uh, exterior stairwell that went uh, to the outside. We simply ran the bellows down the stairs and put the confined space fan up on the top and then cleared the area so that that didn't affect anybody else when it expelled that gas outside. The two curveballs we really had in this situation were A, the, the malfunctioning uh, CO2 detector that was right next to the uh, tank itself. Uh, and the other curveball that we had was the fact that we had gotten uh, a high indication of natural gas present uh, when we were making this entry on our natural gas meter. Uh, after further research and speaking with the manufacturers of the device uh, of the gas ranger, it was discovered that in actuality CO2, the, the physical properties, the chemical properties of CO2 will mimic uh, natural gas in that detection device and actually provide you with a false positive. So we had a false positive, an indication of large amounts of natural gas, yet in actuality there really wasn't any. Uh, and that was, that was a first time for us to know that. I've never heard of that of, in the hazmat world, and I think a lot of people learned that that night as well. So there were several curveballs in this incident uh, that we kind of had to overcome, but all in all, fortunately, no one got hurt, uh, no one died, and we learned a very good lesson. Uh, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to handle these uh, situations uh, with much more efficiency. More and more restaurants and Circle K's and everything else are switching over to this liquid CO2 system because of that expansion ratio. But for us, what it means, all these things that we've found at least are all plumbed with plastic line and the freeze and thaw, those lines have the potential to break and cause the situation we had. The significance of this incident to us is we had two potential civilian victims and possibly more. A lot of times in these situations, the potential rescuers end up being uh, more of the problem than the initial person that was down. Uh, and then of course the close call for our firefighters. We had two firefighters go down into that basement into an oxygen deficient atmosphere and were aware enough to get out of there before, uh, before they went down. So it, it's a pretty significant inc incident for us. It really opened our eyes to the fact that there are these systems all over the city and, uh, and they're all plumbed the same way. There's the potential danger at every one of them. Carbon dioxide gas uh, has a very long history in the world of uh, causing death. And uh, this, interestingly enough, can even occur in open air because carbon dioxide is heavier than air in general and can settle in low-lying areas. So even carbon dioxide, for example, coming out of the opening of mines or whatever, to the surface can settle in low-lying areas so that persons walking through those areas can actually pass out and die because of elevated CO2 concentrations. The uh, toxicity of carbon dioxide is due to two major factors. The first is that it's what's termed a simple asphyxiant in that it can displace air. And since air is about 20.8 or 21 percent oxygen, when you displace that oxygen, you're removing the oxygen that we need to breathe. So you're entering a low oxygen environment. Uh, but unlike other simple asphyxiants, such as nitrogen gas or argon gas, for example, or even helium, which is a common gas used for suicide, uh, unlike those other gases, carbon dioxide in high concentrations also can directly affect the brain to produce coma and respiratory depression and we call this carbon dioxide narcosis or CO2 narcosis. The big issue with it is that it's an oxygen displacer. Uh, but in high concentrations like we had there at McDonald's, they said the potential was about 25% CO2 in that air in the basement. Uh, at that high of a concentration, you tend to, 
get a, a bitter taste in your mouth because the saliva in your mouth breaks that CO2 down into carbonic acid. So you will typically get some sort of a bitter taste and we had a couple guys on scene reporting that bitter taste. The person uh, may start breathing rapidly, feeling as though they can't get their breath. As their brain begins to fail from lack of oxygen, they may become lightheaded, their visual fields may begin to uh, constrict, and uh, their heart rate will increase. They may or may not detect that. And then they will simply go to sleep and pass out from lack of oxygen and from the, the narcotic effect of very high concentrations of carbon dioxide as well. You know, this incident uh, will definitely change my approach to, to those scenarios forever. Um, that basement is a confined space. Uh, there are those large CO2 tanks down there, and when I, you know, when I reflect back about the incident as to how we operated, uh, we, you know, we operated within our, our, our operating procedures, um, and I think the scariest part about this is, is that this could have potentially been a life-threatening incident, and it was solely based on the actions of others. And, you know, those tanks being in there, the large tanks being in there, um, us getting no information, very little information, uh, having to guess, having to investigate ourselves, do all those things that we do on a, no on a normal day-to-day uh, -day basis. All of the information that I've heard about that incident, that it, it could have been a lot worse than it was, I guess. Um, you know, we go on all kinds of different calls on a regular basis and oftentimes don't give them a second thought uh, as long as we make it back to the station. But I, I guess the, the margin of error on this call was uh, a lot less than what it normally is. I guess we could have very easily just taken one breath and, and passed out down there. Um, you know, the two of us being down there kind of in investigating, who knows how long it would have been that we'd have been laying down there um, before somebody else came down and the same thing happened to them. Now you got three, four firefighters laying in your basement unconscious and how long before they're discovered.